We have finally made it to video number three of our three-part series on understanding damage in the last spell. Our first video began with a deep dive into the formula that creates the damage of the last spell. Then our most recent video focused on the spreadsheet that we used to be able to what if an experiment with damage in order to really understand it. And today, we're going to be taking a slight departure from just damage and doing a ever-controversial tier list of all of the stats in the last spell. So, if that sounds interesting to you, without further ado, let's dive into it. I think the best place to begin is by doing a bit of a recap. If you haven't already watched the first two videos in the series, I would highly encourage you to, but this slide will look familiar to you if you have seen them. This was the recap slide or the conclusion slide at the end of the first video, and it gives us some useful data points for how I am thinking about the value of stats. Uh, first and foremost, effective heroes are hitting hard. So big numbers come from utilizing as many different modifiers as possible. You are going to do more damage if you are maxing multiple different columns of damage. If you add isolation on top of opportunism on top of momentum, that is going to be better than any two of those in a vacuum. Beyond that, we know that over-indexing in any one stat causes a loss of efficiency because there is an opportunity cost to choosing that stat and also diminishing returns for taking too much of a good thing. We then came up with five heuristics that we can use for evaluating the quality of a stat in a given moment. The first of those was magnitude. How much are we getting of the thing? The second is probability. How much random chance is involved in the leveraging of a particular stat? Think crit or accuracy. Then there's utilizability or our ability to actually take advantage of that stat. If the stat is isolation but we can't create isolated targets, we have a very hard time utilizing isolation and the value of that stat needs to go down in our mind's eye. Then there's compatibility. Don't take a bunch of multi-hit on a hero that's using a power staff and a sledgehammer. Uh, don't take a lot of opportunism on a hero that can't secure debuffs or is not paired with someone who's going to be debuffing enemies. And then last but not least is diminishing returns. How much of this do I already have? We won't be concerned with all of these as we move through this video, but I wanted to reset that baseline. The final and perhaps most important note from that video, and similarly important here, is that value fluctuates. There is no single right answer. I give this disclaimer before every tier list and no one ever pays attention to me, but I will say it once more here. The value of stats is very situationally dependent. There are so many factors that play into if health is a good choice, depending on what perks you've taken. So we are going to be evaluating things to the best of our abilities, not only considering the I have nothing baseline, but also the way it feeds into builds and those sorts of things, which moves me on to our next thing to talk about, which is some criteria and kind of overview stuff. So we are going to be ranking, as you can see in the lower left corner of the screen, we're going to be ranking non-damage stats. We're going to be ranking movement and skill range and AP. These are things that do not directly contribute to the damage calculation unless you know, momentum, etc. But we're going to be ranking all the stats and we are going to be ranking them in service of creating the best heroes possible. We'll kind of see as we go along what framework we put together. But the game is constantly pitting stats against each other. It is presenting us five stats and asking us to pick one. So I think that this is going to be a useful exercise, even if we're not going to have all the context that comes with the decision to pick a particular stat in a level up, aka we don't know what the hero we're choosing for looks like. And then going back to the previous slide, just as a reminder, there is no single right answer. What is good in one circumstance is not necessarily good in another. But ultimately, the purpose of this endeavor is to make difficult slash impossible categorical decisions. I am going to be more 
uh, sure <laughs> of my answers. I'm going to be essentially numerically ranking uh, stats in a way that we know is impossible. But people love these videos because it baits disagreement. No, no two of us would fill this out exactly the same. No matter how close my tier list is to your tier list, you are going to feel like I transposed two skills that were on the same thing, or you would put one skill one tier higher. And I encourage you to let me know the ways in which you would disagree. But I would also encourage you to remember that tier lists bait this kind of disagreement. So recognize that we're allowed to disagree slightly and that's okay, but at the end of the day, it's a fun dialogue and the dialogue is the value of these types of videos. Last but not least, you will see that there is a blue row there called situational. Uh, it's a bit of a cop-out sometimes because at the end of the day, nearly every stat could be situationally valuable or situationally not valuable. The litmus test that I will use is if a particular stat is good in a particular context, but in the vast majority of situations, it is overwhelmingly situational, aka most of the time it does basically nothing, but in this one case, it's really good. That will save it from being in the bottom tier. It will instead go into situational, and that will communicate that there are times when the stat can be great, but that it requires some very particular stars to align. I've already kind of mentioned this before, but just as a final reminder, the journey here matters way more than the goal. We're going to go through every stat, and in going through every stat, we're going to talk about the pros, the cons, the caveats, why it's good, why it's not good, and that's where the real meat of this of this experience is, not in the final tier list and being like, oh, my A is your C type of thing. And we're going to be trying to make the best heroes we possibly can. So without further ado, let us, uh, let us get down to business and start ranking. As a side note, we should talk for a moment just about structure. You'll, you'll see it in the lower right here. But basically what I've done is I've done a one sentence overview of the stat, the way that I think about it, etc. Then there's some caveats. Is there anything notable about this stat that makes it difficult or interesting to evaluate? And then a bit of an analysis. So we begin with health, which is a interesting place to start. I, I ordered these kind of randomly and then sort of moved things around. But health is, in my opinion, kind of the worst survivability stat that has a side of contributing to damage in a narrow swath of, of times. So if you're going Blood Mage, Sanguine Fuel, uh, Hemo Explosion, Body Builder, you can get some damage out of it. But primarily it is a... It is a defensive stat for keeping your heroes alive, and it's probably the worst of all because it requires some to be paired with some type of recovery mechanism. You need some way to get your health back. Temples aren't exceptionally great at getting your health back. Health potions sometimes don't make a big dent, especially if your health pool starts to get larger. It's one of the problems. As you can see, the max value for health is a thousand. And in some cases, it can be really hard to get back to that threshold. You need something like vampirism or toxic leech. And toxic leech is generally very difficult to get back up there with. But at the end of the day, in specific circumstances, stacking health can be very effective. It is a great way to max out your physical damage by taking bodybuilder, by taking sanguine fuel. You can feed it into a lot of different damage components, and you can create some relatively strong builds. That being said, you can also get into a situation where you have a hero with a large health pool and basically no way to regain that health because health regen caps surprisingly early and you don't want to take a bunch of it anyways. That is daily health regen. So right off the bat, I would say do not take health unless you are specifically building someone who needs it. Nine times out of 10, if your hero is taking damage, health is not the way that you want to protect your hero. So first and foremost, if I can find my cursor here, we're going to put health in situational. Blood Mage bodybuilders 
are excited to have health. But outside of that, I think it is the worst of the survivability stats. Next on the docket is mana. And health and mana, I think it's easy to confuse them as being more similar than they are, than they actually are. And the reason that I say that is mana is a universal engine for increasing the potency of heroes because the strongest abilities in the game generally consume mana, with the possible exception of Quickshot, <laughs> you know, and a few others. But every hero needs mana. It's actually one of the complaints that I have about the design of the game is that the magic column you know, you have, a, you have a physical column of perks, then you have a ranged column, and then you have a magic column. And the magic column is heavily focused on mana using abilities that everyone is using mana. Your sword is using mana, your hammer is using mana, your longbow is using mana. So mana is important to everyone, and it is one of those stats that's in a pretty good sweet spot, I think, compared to health. It is easier to recoup mana, and there are more viable options. Things like mana wells can be very effective. So mana's primary issue is when you are in a specific night and you run out of mana before the end of the night. It's essentially like running out of gas and needing to pull over on the side of the road. And so early on, that can be a problem, and picking up a mana upgrade at like the, the green level, for instance. 12 more mana is probably buying you like three to four more casts of your high impact spells in a given night, which I think makes it stronger. Also, by default, you have things like mana collector that, or excuse me, uh, mana fuel that are allowing you to convert some portion of it over into damage more readily than say needing to have bodybuilder and you know these other things to get a more specific damage buff or needing to have blood mage plus sanguine fuel. So at the end of the day, I, I like mana. I think taking a mana upgrade can be good in some situations and having a large mana pool well, it can sometimes be a pain to refill, can be really nice because it gives you the tank of gas to do that like big burst damage when you need it. So mana for me is going to live, I think in the in the B tier. I don't think it's it's overwhelmingly powerful, but it can be nice to pick up occasionally. There are lots of things that I would take over a large mana upgrade, but getting a hero into like the 100 mana range basically means that in any given night, you're, you're very, very strong. The other thing I should mention about mana that might actually like tick it down to a C now that I'm thinking a little harder about it is a lot of times if you're not taking mana fuel or those types of things, sustain is better than big pool. AKA it's better to be getting back mana as you're spending mana and mitigate that the mana that you're spending than going the other way. And so to that end, I think I will pop it down to C. It's still good, but it's kind of in that B, C territory where uh, unless there are certain circumstances prevailing, it's a little hard to recommend, but it's certainly not a bad thing to pick up. And using your mana abilities is an important facet of the game and it is an important part of being able to take advantage of your heroes. And we'll see. Some of these may shift around as we go. I have not planned out this, uh, this particular tier list. Next, we got action points. Action points are good. Uh, at 12 action points, sometimes it's slightly less good. It's sometimes hard to use all 12 action points in a given turn. But that being said, action points are very, very good. The thing that I will say about action points as like a, a bit of an aside is that action points are, are the primary or one of the primary reasons why I think Omen of Advanced Training is perhaps one of the best omens in the game. And the reason is, is that action points only show up at the blue tier of level up and Having more things show up at blue tier means you are more likely to get more action points, and action points are ultimately the primary limiting factor on every turn that your heroes are going to be taking. So to that end, it is not hard to put action points in the S tier. 
I think when it is very, very, very rare that I see an action point pop up in a level up and do not immediately grab it. Or I do not see an action point show up on a pair of legs or on a shield and I don't grab them immediately. So action points, exceptional. Hopefully that comes as a surprise to exactly no one. Next, we need to talk about movement points. Uh, what I said here is, I think, very true. If you punch someone in the face and run away, they can't punch you back. And this is a truth of the universe that I think applies both to basically all the defensive stats here and to movement, which is that I would more often than not much prefer grabbing a level of movement than grabbing armor, dodge, resistance, or block. Because if I can go someplace in order to use up my action points, or I can go someplace at the end of a turn so I don't get hit, that is always preferable to me than being able to take the hit. Uh, and part of that has to do with something we'll talk about a bit later, but it, it largely has to do with the fact that sometimes hits come with debuffs. You have hoppers that are poisoning you. You have uh, archers that are debuffing your movement. And so even if you are completely resilient, you still don't necessarily want to get hit. And if you can step out of the way and not get hit, that's pretty much gravy. So I often want to take movement on every one of my heroes. The, the reason for that is partly just that utilizing a hero fully, using all of their action points, is almost always going to require going to places. If I run out of movement before I have killed, like, if I run out of movement and I don't have more enemies in my sphere of influence, it means I can't kill anything else and it means that I'm wasting action points, which is a huge problem. Secondly, movement is incredibly effective for momentum builds. It's a huge engine of basically the biggest hits in the game. If you want the biggest numbers in the game, you need to be stacking up some movement in addition to the momentum and things that you are grabbing. But I think the last thing that makes movement in my mind very, very, very strong is the adaptability that it provides you in in terms of being able to decide how you want to allocate your heroes. If you have a bunch of heroes that all have like five to eight movement and you haven't fully gotten your warp gates up and operational, you can end up in a situation where it is multiple turns of lost productivity to get a hero to support another hero who is falling behind. Let's say you have a hero and they randomly get stunned and you're like, okay, I need to get a second person over there to help. There is basically no substitute for movement to make sure that that happens, to make sure that your hero gets from point A to point B. And for that reason, I think that movement does live in the S tier for me. And it is simply because you cannot, it is very, very, very hard to have a hero function appropriately without the ability to move. It is not, and, and this is where, like, you know, tier list, maybe I, I knock it down to A because there are situations where you have a, a field study, long range hero that doesn't need a ton of movement because they have a ton of skill range, etc. Movement is really good. I don't think you should not be taking it. I think top of A tier probably feels good. I was tempted by S tier, but I'm going to try and use the full latitude of the uh, of of the the spectrum that the tier list offers us. And I think momentum is exceptional, but or excuse me, not momentum. I think that movement is exceptional, but it is not. It's not one of those things that, like, you can build heroes with limited movement and they can be effective, so I don't want to put it in that S tier, knock your socks off completely. Skill range is its counterpart. And skill range is really interesting, I will say. Uh, first, it has the major caveat that it doesn't affect all skills. Uh, no amount of skill range is going to improve your... Uh, your one-handed hammer's primary attack. It is just not skill range modifiable. And beyond that, I think skill range suffers more from vision 
based things like blockers. So with movement, you can move around and you can see around things and you can get to the right position. With skill range, you if, you, if you're choosing skill range over movement, you are sometimes putting yourself in a position where you don't have the ability to get around the, the thing that you're looking at and you have to decide to say kill it instead, which is a cost of AP that you may or may not want to do. Now, there are some things to note about skill range. In a lot of cases, for a fair number of weapons that have follow or maneuver abilities, skill range is exceptional and can yield way more movement than movement can yield. Also, the fact that the cap is relatively low at 8 skill range means that getting it capped can have a huge impact. The, the ability for a dash to move you nine tiles on the one-handed sword is mind-boggling in terms of the value that it can bring, back, bring around. Now, the other thing to note is you get less skill range than you get movement, but the way that I think about that and the balance of that is that I think movement, you have to do a round trip. You have to walk somewhere and then you have to walk back. Whereas with skill range, you're just reaching a little further and hitting someone. So... To that end, and, and this is where things get a little tricky, I do think that skill range also belongs in the A tier, but I still prefer movement to skill range, except in some more niche cases. For the average hero, I would rather pick up movement than skill range. Luckily, one is a primary stat, one is a secondary stat, so you're not really, they aren't in direct contention for the same resources, but... Uh, in some cases, I like one a little bit more. In other cases, I like the other one a little bit more. Now, we have quite the block of defensive stats that we need to, uh, that we need to work our way through. The first of which is block. And for those who are not fully familiar, block is your flat damage reduction. So you have 100 block, you take 100 less damage off the final result of the damage calculation. The, the caveats, and I don't even know if this is entirely a caveat, but the observation that I would make about block is that it is the strongest early game defensive stat in my book, and it is the one that falls off the hardest in the later game. Because initially, let's say you take Omen of Sturdiness as an example. You get 8 block, and it basically makes you immortal on the first few nights of the game. It's really nice. Try it sometime if you haven't already. You can basically, without any fear of retribution, wander your heroes out into the battlefield and, uh, and, and do, your, do your worst and not worry much about the horde at all. And I have had some strategies where that has been very consequential. But it falls off. At some point, 15 block is a very small percentage of the overall damage that you're taking, and things like resistance would overtake it. Now, there are going to be some spiky counter apologists in, in the viewing audience that are going to say, oh, well, the, the real benefit is you can get more durable and you can do a bunch of damage. Spiky counter is a tough one for me. Uh, the issue with spiky counter is that it really only pops off if you are fighting ranged enemies so that you can get hit by more than four enemies in a given turn, right? Otherwise, they're just the four adjacent enemies. And in that case, spiky counter can do some serious damage, right? If you have a wave that is hunters and archers and hoppers, spiky counter can go a little crazy. But, much to my chagrin, spiky counter is not, does not proc boom, so you're not going to get any ancillary damage. You know, you might hit for over a thousand with your spiky counter if you've, you know, set up your physical damage properly and your regular damage, but it's not, it's not quite there. The, so, so beyond that, I, I view it as primarily a, a defensive stat, and I do want to rank the defensive stats a bit on the spectrum. But in the grand scheme of things, it is, in my opinion, one of the more interesting damage stats, but not, or one of the more interesting defensive stats without being particularly useful. And I say that because to do the general disclaimer, I do not think that defensive stats are a great use of resources. I think that 
as a player levels up a hero, they are better improving that hero's ability to kill things so that those things cannot hit the hero than create more durable heroes so that their heroes can spend longer getting beat on or something like that. So since I don't think, as I said on the slide, punches are the path to victory in the last spell, punches to the face that is, none of the defensive stats are going to rank all that highly in our overall tier list, but I will try to create some delineation between them. So on to our next stat, which is armor. And armor is essentially ablet of health. It is health that you can lose every turn in perpetuity, and it just comes back time after time after time. It's pretty nice. Uh, it is basically like a no downside type of durability. And I think that in the, on average, in the early and late game, I think armor is my favorite defensive stat. When I take organic armor and all of my armor gets converted to health, it always stings because armor does a shocking amount of good for the hero because it, it requires no sustain. It is self-sustaining. Every turn you can be like, hey, I can take 200 damage and nothing bad at all happens to me and next turn I can do the same thing. And generally speaking, there aren't huge spikes in damage from night to night in the last spell. So the idea that you can you can take that damage over and over again and once you're kind of like comfortably into a night and you're like yeah now i know i'm gonna take about 100 damage a turn cool i can just wander around with impunity now armor has some some nice bonuses that come along with it uh it it can be converted into health and through bodybuilder converted into other things like uh, like physical uh damage for instance and I think it is also the path to the most unkillable heroes. The most unkillable heroes are heroes that have a bunch of armor and can take a bit of a beating in addition to having some other defensive stats. But overall, I don't really think of it as a, as a damage stat. The, the path to getting there where, you know, like you have to have organic armor and then you have to have bodybuilder, so on and so forth. It's a long and twisting path that I don't think is really worth thinking about. And it does have some, you know, some disadvantages. Like, you know, hoppers are going to chip you down through, through armor, etc. But I will give it the coveted B rank of, of defensive stats because I think armor is, is a solid uh, contender that comes in healthy chunks. Getting 40 hit points every turn for one level up that you can take in damage without any effect on the long-term health of your history is pretty, pretty darn strong. Ah, uh, resistance. So resistance is, in my opinion, the gold standard for late game invulnerability, right? You get your resistance up into like the 80% range and you are just an unstoppable monster, but holy cow, is it expensive to get there 10% at a time? Uh, that is a huge investment to make, to make your hero unkillable when, as we have discussed, I think that unkillable heroes are not necessarily what the doctor ordered. The, the nature of the last spell is your heroes can be perfectly healthy and the horde will still trample right past them and destroy the last spell. You need to be killing stuff, and resistance does not really provide you any path towards killing stuff, and your immortality doesn't mean a thing if the world is doomed because you couldn't protect the last spell. I do think you get a, a bit of this kind of like just from gear here and there, and I enjoy it. I think it helps make more resilient heroes, but I do think that res resistance kind of lives under block in my mind, and maybe... I like mana more than block. I think it lives down here. Some other things may weasel their way in between them. I think the gap between block and resistance is actually somewhat significant. Uh, I think block is substantially better than uh, resistance in, in my book. But that brings us to dodge. Uh, oh, boy. Dodge is, is great until it's not great, and then it's just the worst. It's, uh, it's the only defensive stat here that I think completely can't stand on its own. Uh, 
If you forsake everything else and you're like, I'm just going to make my hero durable because it has dodge, your hero is going to die. And the reason is, is because of that max cap of 95. Uh, as a reminder, enemies have accuracy, and then you will always have a 5% chance of being hit. And so if you put yourself in an overwhelmingly bad position, you're going to get hit by some stuff. One of the things you might get hit by is a twisted death ray that is undodgeable. <laughs> so to that end, dodge by itself cannot keep you alive to be able to wade into the horde and do the things that you need it to do. Now, it comes with some interesting opportunities. Bless an Adrenaline Rush is a very interesting build, but at the end of the day, a dead hero cannot take advantage of it. So dodge is going to receive the first coveted R rank uh, for any skill. And it is because I think that it is unreliable and its unreliability just leads to hero death and it requires too much investment in other things to make it work. Like if you tell me that in order to make a dodge tank hero, I also have to take a bunch of armor and a bit of resistance, it's, it's just too much. It's too many primary stats that you're asking me to pick up and I'm trying to do all that while I'm trying to cap my dodge at 90%, 10% at a time. Not a great, not a great path forward. Okay, I made a quick cut there because I just wanted to make sure because it blew my mind that 10% is a blue upgrade for dodge. It is, you get a lot of it from gear, but again, 10 levels to max out your dodge is incredibly expensive for what you're getting. So, R rank confirmed. I, I like to check these things when something looks slightly off to me. I don't take dodge a lot, I wanted to make sure. Let's move on to damage. What's, what is there to say about damage? Damage is the, the gold standard to which all damage stats are measured. It has no caveats. You take it and you get it. It obviously suffers from diminishing returns, but it is just always active. You take it and it doesn't matter what weapon you're using. It doesn't matter who you're attacking. You're going to do more damage for the damage that you have taken. And it is always fully utilized. So the evergreen nature of damage and the high cap, the fact that you can go up to 100% damage, just means that it is pretty darn exceptional. Now, if you go up to 500% damage, the diminishing returns are, are mind-boggling. You're getting a lot less bang for your buck than you were getting at the beginning. If you were starting at 10% for a level up, you are not getting 10% as you approach 500%. You're getting like 2% or something like that. But there is no question, it lives very firmly in the A tier, top of A tier from my perspective. Damage is the pizza of stats. Even when it's not that great, it's still good. That brings us to a stat that is more difficult to evaluate, and that is critical. And what I say about critical here is just that it's RNG until it's not. And that is because I think that when you start to pursue critical, your goal should be to get your critical pretty darn high. You, you don't want to be like, I'm just going to take 10% crit, because it means 90% of the time, that 10% is doing nothing for you. If you get up to 50% crit, it's starting to be like, most of the time, I hit. You know, you hit 70%, you're like, yeah, it's, it's disappointing when I don't crit. And then you hit 100%, you're like, all right, now we're in business. It is a hard stat to take early because unlike a lot of other stats, it gets better with age, not worse. This is one of the weird things we'll talk about when we talk about crit and the way that crit pairs with crit power but the short version is is that crit starts out and you're kind of like eh, it's not doing that much it's like it's the occasional 1.5 times damage from my crit power type of thing but where this gets tricky to evaluate is is that when you consider it in concert with its partner crit power it is offering up the single largest increase in damage that the game has to offer. And that is crit power's 30% increase from a blue level up. That's massive. That is a huge increase that you can only get from the co-investment in crit and crit power. And what we saw in the spreadsheet is, is that starting to invest in crit 
kind of is like a, a stonks moment, you know, like crit and crit power, just go to the moon and have this kind of like interesting feedback loop type of thing where they're like growing one on top of the other. And that makes it a hard one to evaluate, but one that I think is like, oh, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard for me where to put crit. I think that believe it or not, I am going to put crit at the bottom of S tier. And the reason that I say that is because I think its biggest flaw, its two biggest flaws are it requires a lot to, of investment to get it going. And in the meantime, while you're investing in it, you're not getting a lot out of it. But that being said, towards the end of a run, it is so incredibly powerful because of the constellation of perks that come along with it. I'm talking about Crit Master. I'm talking about Mana Collector. These are perks that transform the heroes that utilize Crit. When you get a multi-hit Crit Master hero going, there is no stopping them because it is so easy to max out Crit power. And basically at that point, if you have 100% Crit and 500% Crit power, that is an incredible 5x to your damage that you're not going to find in a lot of other places. So big investment, but big reward is my read on Crit. Uh, and with that, we come to crit power, the, the second half of this. And the, the idea that you can get a 30% damage increase with 100% utilization is, is madness, right? You're getting 10% increase from damage at 100% utilization, and with the additional investment in crit here, you can get 100% utilization on three times that move for your heroes. What I will say, though, is that it isn't always so rosy. The example that I use in the caveat section here is if you have 10% crit, you can multiply that 10% by the 30% that you would get if you had 100% crit, and you get a 3% damage increase, which is not great. Taking a blue level upgrade and getting 3% damage is not that good. But it's not 3% forever. Every time you take, if you take that blue crit power upgrade... It improves the quality of all future crit. All future crit now has baked into it that that crit power that you took is going to improve over time. What I will say, though, is I think crit power is something that can come from more places, right? So we talked about crit master as an example. There's also explosive essence and, and a variety of other things. So while I think the, the dynamic duo of crit and crit power are, are amazing... I think I'm going to put crit power a little below damage. Now, I know I'm comparing a primary to a secondary here, but I think crit is the engine. Crit is the thing that enables all of the perks. It has all the powerful synergies, etc. And crit power is something that, one, will scale just if you have crit master, but also that you can get from more sources and that is perhaps slightly less overall impactful. So that's an interesting one. I love crit and crit power. I'm a little sad to see crit power down in A tier, but I think it's, I think it's warranted, whereas crit, because of its, its unique synergies and enablers, uh, goes a little higher. Accuracy. Ooh, I, I've been dreading accuracy. And the reason is, is because of what you see right here at the, the beginning. When you need accuracy, there is no single better stat to pick than accuracy. And that includes resistance reduction, which we're going to talk about next, which has a similar vibe. When you need resistance reduction, it's amazing, but a lot of times it's not worth anything at all. And both of these stats, like it says in the caveats, when you're over cap on them, there's nothing. There's nothing for you. You gain nothing from accuracy beyond the dodge of the enemy that you're attacking. And... Because both resistance on enemies and dodge on enemies scales up at a low factor as you go, like later nights, you're going to see more dodge on even basic enemies and more resistance on basic enemies. <clears throat> but generally, wave composition determines it. If you're not seeing kindled, if you're not seeing twisted, you're not going to worry too much about resistance. And similarly, if you're not seeing 
uh, crawlers, if you're not seeing dodgers in a given wave, you're not going to be as worried about, I guess, hunters too. You're not going to be as worried about, uh, about having accuracy. And so as a result, where I have come to on my thinking about accuracy is that there is a minimum threshold that you need to achieve before you are like comfortable. And I have put it at 25 to 30%. It is not enough to handle the dodgiest of enemies with 100% certainty, but it is enough to make sure that only those dodgy enemies are something that you need to think about, right? Maybe use your wand user to take out the crawlers or something like that. But largely, if you have 25 to 30, I don't worry too much about it. The AP loss that's going to come from missing attacks with uh, because you you didn't take advantage, you didn't have enough accuracy to overcome their dodge, is nominal enough at 25% accuracy that I don't worry too much about it. This feeds into a larger debate that is happening right now around like omen of dexterity. I consider it to be perhaps the best omen in the game. And I say that because it is cheap and every one of my heroes is going to take a few level ups in accuracy. But if I take that 12% accuracy bump from the omen, that means that for the first five or six nights of a run, I don't have to worry about accuracy. I can take the damage up. I can take the AP. I can take the other things and not have to worry too much about what's going on and if I'm going to be missing things. So to that end, I love that because it means that I'm generally like one blue accuracy upgrade away from feeling good for the rest of the run, right? I'll have 25 base accuracy just from levels. And that's going to mean that I'm relatively comfortable with where I've landed. I'll get the rest from gear. Everything will be fine. So to that end, the, the omen of dexterity's value in my eyes, is that it gives me time to wait for the blue level up, so I don't have to say take two mediocre level ups in accuracy because I have a hero that has negative four accuracy right now, and I'm panicking, and I, I see that green or that gray upgrade, and I'm like, it would help a little bit. I don't need to do that if I take Omen of Dexterity. All of my heroes are going to have a decent baseline that gives me five nights to find the right blue level up to get, uh, to get my accuracy basically where I need to in a single level. So to that end, I am going to put accuracy at the top of A tier. I think it's good. I think it is very good. If you need it, you need to pick some up basically on every hero. If you are not, there is no single larger damage loss. Reliability, you'll be like, oh, I took a 20% or a 30% haircut on that attack because I was attacking a Kindled and I didn't have enough resistance reduction. But that can be mitigated with magic weapons and also a miss or two misses or three misses because the RNG is just not on your side on a Klar is so much more devastating than hitting three times for less than you wanted. So speaking of which, let's move on to resistance reduction. Basically the same story as what I just told you about accuracy. If you're facing enemies with resistance value, uh, it's not gonna, there's not, not going to be a lot of things better than it. It's going to be great. And all enemies have some resistance, so it's nice to pick up. I don't think it is omen requiring because you can have magic weapons. Magic weapons get around the need for resistance reduction, which means that it is a stat that is a little redundant in terms of, of, its, of its value. You can do without. Now, the other thing that I, I noted here, just because I think it's important, is your resistance reduction caps at 100%, and you can never send an enemy's reduction, resistance reduction, or resistance, excuse me, negative, right? So if I have 100% resistance reduction and an enemy has 5% resistance, they still have zero resistance, which means that going, again, going over cap, going beyond the 20 to 30 accuracy, you know, threshold is probably not good for business. But having a little bit of it is good, and it's nice to pick up. On some, some abilities, it's more useful than others. I think resistance reduction on hand crossbows is very nice, and so I'll occasionally pick it up. As a result, I'm going to put it in B tier. I think, I think it is good. It is not as good as accuracy. The difference between them, I think, is quite significant. Accuracy is a far higher priority for me than resistance reduction, but it's nice to pick some up. 
And now, the one that you are all waiting for, reliability. If you are interested in my thoughts on reliability, you can read the slide that's, I guess, down there. I am not going to do that. <laughs> we have a whole tier dedicated to reliability. That's why it's an R, not an F tier. It's because it's the reliability tier, and Dodge kind of fits into that. What I am going to do with our time here is I am going to take a moment for a public service announcement. Let me take a, a sip here. There's nothing in this class. I apologize. But this is an announcement. <laughs> we have merch. This is the first piece of merch for the channel. If you enjoy these videos and you are so inclined, I wanted people to have another means to support the channel and merch like this is going to be available on our new website. Uh, this in particular, I'm, I'm quite pleased with it. I, I worked pretty hard on it, but it is, the, it is the reliability mug. And if this will lose my face for a second, the deal with the reliability mug is, is that on the front, you have this nice little design that says reliability. I made some filigrees. And then on the back, you have, and I don't know if you'll be able to see all this, it is the fine print. And uh, it takes the form of a prescription drug disclaimer and gives you lots of information about all sorts of things. Uh, I'll, I'll read some bits and pieces. Uh, uses temporarily relieves minor inconsistencies due to excessive tome use, two-handed uh, axe dependence, two-handed axe dependency, uh, bow and quiver sickness, uh, bad breakpoint syndrome, so on and so forth. There's a lot of fun Easter eggs in here. I had a great time making this mug. But... It speaks to, I think, the deal with reliability, which is that there are a lot of caveats. Reliability is one of those things where it's hard to understand. There are a lot of stats like it in video games where you go, yeah, stats like this are usually sleeper powerful. That is not the case in Last Spell. It's just bad. It has a lot of side effects, and I wanted to capture all of them for all of you moving forward. On that note, <laughs> this is not the only thing that we're going to be offering up. So really quickly, as a shameless plug, we have a website now, aldenpotamus.com exists. And I won't bore you with all the details, but among other things, it is a place for us all to go to get access to some of the things. So we've got some other merch. Like, uh, like for instance, you can see here I have, uh, I have the, the water glass. Uh, available. Uh, we, I've, I've ordered all of these things so that people can check them out. Over here I have, uh, I have the patch, the, the Potamus People patch, uh, which is pretty neat. Oh, the autofocus is, uh, is, is uh, conspiring against me. Hold on, let me go. Let me go full screen again here. One, one that I'm particularly excited about, this is not mine, but this is, uh, this is Sasha's uh, Micropotamus sweatshirt, which I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the way that it turned out. It's, uh, it's got nothing on the back, so it's super chill. You know, we're, I'm not trying to like blow people away with giant logos. Well, there is a big logo if you're excited about it, but it's just got the little, the little Potamus head logo, which I think is pretty neat. Like I said, we got the, uh, we got the glass. <sighs> refreshing, I, I must say. And then, uh, and then the Potamus People patch. Uh, we're still working on this one. When we ordered the sample, it had a black border, and I'm working on getting them to correct that. Uh, but there's a variety of merch, but I didn't want that to be the purpose of the site, right? So yes, moving to this site has given us, uh, oopsie, has given us the ability to have a site and a place where, a storefront where we can sell merch. All of the merch is drop shipped for the time being. At some point, we'll do stickers and a variety of other things. But I wanted this website to also be a resource. So first and foremost, the schedule will always be available. Uh, not only the schedule, but we'll also have a kind of evergreen schedule with some information about what we're playing on any given day and a summary of each of the games that we're currently playing with a link to the playlist if you're curious about going back and finding other content in that space. Uh, there's a team section that highlights all of the different people that are involved in making the Potamus people uh, what they are. This list will grow over time, I hope. Uh, an about section with some, some Easter eggs and those types of things. Uh, we have a section now that has information about all of our bigger projects, like the damage calculator, etc. Uh, the, the list goes on. 
I won't I won't bore you with all the gory details, but I'm very excited about this and I thought that I would take reliability's time slot to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is not reliability. So, with that done, let's get back to the festivities. Thank you for for tolerating uh that kind of bit of an interruption. Uh it is it's just a fun thing. I'm I'm not expecting to get rich off of the merch. I have priced the merch to be a fun thing that people can pick up, not so that I can kind of line my pockets. But the proceeds of the merch and channel memberships and all the different things that we're running right now will all feed back into the channel, hopefully to make these videos more frequent and higher production quality. But with that, reliability, one note. Reliability scales off the difference between your min and your max damage, not your overall damage. So 20% reliability is very, very, very different than 20% damage because you're getting 20% of a much smaller range. But I, I digress. No more talk about reliability. Moving on to daily health regen. So, woof. <laughs> not not the best one to, to follow up reliability with because this is also not a great one. It certainly has some interesting like upside. You know, the, the whole like coagulation into organic armor into bodybuilder means that daily health regen is the best thing you can pick up for a blood mage, organic armor blood mage. But but largely it's it's too slow. It's not a great way to heal your heroes. And as a result, I think it is a very it's a very weak stat to, to pick up. So despite the perks that make it better, I do think coagulation makes it a nice pickup because I do like armor. Armor is all the way up there. I think that daily health regen firmly lives in the reliability tier, a little bit up from reliability. But it is, it is not a great stat. There's almost always something that is better, both for sustain or other things. I would much rather take Vampirism or Toxic Leech than invest in Daily Health Regen because among other things, it only takes effect at the end of the night and that's pretty punishing. A stat by a similar name that I have a different opinion on though is Daily Mana Regen. Your Daily Mana Regen can be 100% of the cap of mana. You can have 140 mana max and you can have 140 daily mana regen, which means that it can always fully fill your tank. And beyond that, it's a nice kind of low watermark where you can say, okay, I have 20 daily mana regen. So I can pay attention to how much mana I've used during this night and know how much I'm going to get back so that I can stay in that like sustainability zone. So I think it's a much more effective stat for leveraging to to kind of like create sustainable heroes and know how much you can do in a given night. And by bumping it up, you can say, okay, now if I have 10 more or let's say I take a blue upgrade and I have five more daily mana regen, that's probably like two casts of strong spells more that I can do a day without starting to go into mana debt. So in that way, I I like it. It is a little bit eclipsed in the late game by things like mana collector that I think are better ways to keep things going. And it is not a panacea if you have a small mana pool. If you have 20 mana, for instance, you could have a bunch of daily mana regen, but it's not going to do you that much good. But for your average hero who has like 40-ish mana or something like that, I like daily mana regen slightly more than I like getting more mana, despite the fact that there may be some, some better upsides to mana in terms of being able to feed into magic fuel and a few other things. But I think daily mana regen is a great way, especially early in the game, to be like, okay, I'm just going to give my, my hero a little more capacity to free cast, which is going to transform into into other value like you know the ability to cast that extra uh bees or whatever it happens to be all right so that is uh, that's daily mana regen now we have healing received so 
this is this is a tricky one to evaluate. There are there are four things that benefit from healing receives I, received. I believe there are perks that heal you, like vampire and toxic leech. There are healing potions. There are uh, there is daily health regen, and then there is building abilities like uh, like the temple or basically just the temple. And all of these things benefit from healing received. But in most cases, it's not worth taking healing received to improve your perks or to improve your potions or your building abilities or any of that stuff or your daily health regen. The only time it's really useful is when your perks aren't pulling in their weight. So you have a vampire bodybuilder and he's not able to fill himself up and you take a 50% healing received, and all of a sudden his three-point heals are now five-point heals. It makes a big difference. So with that in mind, for the heals that you, for the times when you need it, it is great. Uh, but it is very situational. And as a result, whoops, I'm grabbing the wrong one, it's going to go in situational. And I think it's going to go below health in situational, but they're basically effectively tied because they're in fact situational for the same build. Next on the docket is stun. So stun is another hard one to evaluate because it is useless for non-stunners, but it is insanely important for people who are stunning. And the stun builds from my perspective are really opportunist stun with power staff and sledgehammer and uh, poison multi-hit with septic shock and daggers. This is the one that I think I struggle most with in terms of situational. And the reason is, is that I think there are a couple builds that benefit from it, and it is so broadly applicable for the builds that utilize it. What I mean by that is... There are a lot of games that would have taken a much harsher approach to stun. Basically, you can stun everything. You can stun a bulky. You can stun a twisted, unless it's immune. But mostly, unless there's some type of like effect on the enemy, be it a twisted buff or a uh, the sprayers from Glenwald, you're going to be able to stun basically anything, which means that it's a bit more mainstream. You can do a legit build around stuns, and in fact, some of my most successful runs, like my zero XP run, could probably would have failed horribly in the absence of stun, because it's just one of those things, when you get your stun up to 100%, you can very reliably stall a wave in its totality. So I don't want to put it in situational. I think I want to put it at the bottom of A tier. I think I want to put it between movement and skill range. And that is despite the fact that it is situational, I think there are enough situations and there are enough different builds that can potentially benefit from it that I like stun and I want it represented in the main bulk. So that's stun for you. You get it in really healthy proportions too. You get in 15% building towards 100%. That is a really kind uh, dispensation. It means that it is relatively easy for a hero to max out stun in a given run with a little bit of gear and some lucky level ups. So next we we're going to talk about experience gain. And this is another hard one to evaluate. We've actually been having a bit of a discussion in the Discord. Uh, link in the description if you want to join the Discord. I would highly recommend it. We talk about a lot of cool stuff. But uh, but one of the members of the community, I think it was Red, uh, was talking about an analysis that they did around XP. And the thing about XP that is tricky is when you hit a breakpoint and you get a level that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten, that's a massive boon. And when that doesn't happen, add the, the, the XP gain did nothing for you. So XP gain is in this kind of like difficult situation where if it's utilized properly and if you get what you need out of it, it can be very good, but it may, it may yield nothing. Uh, the other piece of XP gain is, is that it's basically, it's a young man's game. It is, uh, 
it is for low-level heroes who are going to get the benefit of it over a long time. And it does have a, very early in runs, it does have a compounding effect because you can keep your roster low, give them XP gain, and then raise the overall level of your heroes so that when you recruit a new hero, you have essentially added a bunch of XP to the overall ecosystem because you're recruiting a higher level hero. So XP is good. It is sometimes tricky to utilize, but the idea that it can have such a dramatic effect on the overall level of your roster is very, very, very powerful. So to that end, I am going to put it at the top of B tier because it's, it's good, but sometimes it's, it's unimpactful. Sometimes it never gets you to that next level up. Sometimes you take some XP and you don't do it. The way that I usually approach XP is I will pick a hero who is my like power level the in hero. And despite the fact that it's an average, you can usually roll to find someone the same level as your highest person. And so I will power level one person up, letting their other stuff, stats suffer in order to get them to the point where they can unlock new hero levels in the inn. And I think that can be very useful, but it's a bit situational. And sometimes if you just take a little bit of XP on people, they're never going to reach that extra level by the end of the game. Or maybe they'll get, you know, a little bit, uh, they'll get one extra level on the final night. And for the vast majority of the run, it will have made no difference and just had the opportunity cost when compared to other things. So that's the way I think about that. Oh, multi-hit. Uh... Multi, it is a unique asterisk <laughs> multiplier that comes in massive, sometimes as much as 50% increases. That first multi hit you take on quick shot with a hand crossbow is a 50% increase in your damage. Basically, no, no questions asked. The thing about multi hit that makes it a, I mean, I'm not going to bury the lead, makes it an easy inclusion in S tier, despite the fact that it is somewhat situational, kind of like stun, is it is, it is the only unique in that sense multiplier that utilization of 100% is basically guaranteed. You can play smart and basically guarantee that every one of your hits hits someone who is still alive. You have no waste of hits and you can, no other heroes other than multi-hit heroes devastate the battlefield like multi-hit heroes do. The... The only downside to it is not every attack is a multi-hit attack. And I don't think that's a big downside if you're kind of building towards it. And multi-hit scales with crit and it scales with uh, crit master, etc. And mana collector to make it really easy for you to get, to fill up your mana, to murder everything and build your crit power to infinity, so on and so forth. Uh, and just, just the idea that you could take the base damage that you have cultivated, all, you know, the, the sum of all of your isolation, all of your opportunism, all of your, all of these good things that you have collected, and you can multiply it by like nine with, with uh, magic missiles, for instance, is, it's bonkers. Absolutely unbelievable. Uh, the thing that it is competing with is the next thing we're going to talk about, which is propagation damage. What I have to say about propagation damage is, is that it does the same thing that I just described. You know, you can have a lightning bolt that's going to hit 13 targets or whatever the, the max is. Maybe it's more than that. Is it 17 targets? It's something insane. Because it's, uh, it's 8 plus whatever. I think lightning bolt hits 9 targets. I think it's 17. Anyways. So it's, it's a lot. It's like multi-hit functionally, but with a complete lack of user agency and control. The, the big but here is, is that you're never going to get it to work just the way you want it to. It's going to make a left turn when you don't want it to make a left turn. It's not going to hit the enemy that you need it to hit at the moment that you need to hit it. It is one of the most random things that exists in the game. And that makes it significantly worse than, than multi-hit, kind of unsurprisingly. The, the other piece about propagation is, is that it consumes two slots in the secondary camp. There is your propagation bounces and your propagation damage. Your propagation damage, for context, is how much each bounce 
tapers off after the last. So it starts out at 85%, and then you basically lose 15% damage every time it bounces until it gets to the end. And you can increase that so that it loses none over its travel. But the issue is you can't go above your initial base damage. So it's just it just is what it is. And the stronger your propagates get, the more likely it is that they are going to terminate themselves. You're going to run out of targets. It's going to make a left-hand turn at a random enemy who's like sticking off, and it's not going to be able to go back because it killed the guy that it entered through. So propagation... It requires a huge amount of like micromanagement to, to get the value out of it. And I generally don't think that it is worth the worth the squeeze. Some of the strongest propagate abilities also don't do damage. And the reason that they're so strong, or they do very little damage, the reason that they're so strong is because they're not killing things, and as a result, you get the full number of jumps. I'm thinking like the Tome debuff. I'm thinking like bees. These are, these are abilities that can at least bounce around a lot because they're not killing things immediately. Although bees damage still scales up and eventually starts biting itself, you know, biting the hand that feeds it anyways. So we have two to allocate here. I think if I'm thinking about this, I'm going to put Propagate Bounces in the B tier under resistance reduction and propagation damage kind of at the bottom of C tier. Because I really don't think propagation damage. The difference between 75% drop off and 100% drop off, I, I don't think in practice it makes a huge difference. So propagation damage, I almost never take. It's, it's flirting with top of reliability tier. In fact, just to ruffle some feathers and makes the the propagation apologists angry. I will move it down there just to uh, just to make some people uh, leave comments and let me know how mad I am. This leads us to our next one, which uh, which appears to be misnamed. I'll fix that in post. But this is your specific damage types. So physical, magic, and ranged. These are the Gold standard damage equivalent for the secondary level ups. They used to be primary way back in the day, in the before times, but they have one big but that keeps them from being quite as good, and that is that they only apply to one weapon type. And from my perspective, I think that if you are playing the last spell and you're largely going, this hero is going to be a physical hero, I think you're leaving a lot of power on the table because I think the best weapon marriages generally cross damage types. It's combining a power staff with a sledgehammer. It's combining a hand crossbow with a wand. If you're trying to stick to one, I think you're making a mistake. And so if you aren't sticking to one and you're going with those more generalist builds that draw from multiple spaces, these are basically half as useful. You're going to get half as much value approximately on average from a range upgrade if half the time you're using a wand. That does not change the fact, though, that they are very strong. The other thing is their cap is relatively low at 200%. So the most you're ever going to get out of this is a 2x, which is attainable, but they're a nice place to dip into because I find later in the game I can get a nice additional boost of damage because they are essentially on their own diminishing return. So, you know, that's their, that's their real value. And for me... That puts them like top of B tier. I think they're slightly worse than like a flat damage upgrade because of that caveat. But they are quite good and sometimes you can get them in abundance. Like a bodybuilder blood mage is going to be probably capping at 200% physical damage for most runs. And that's, that's a nice thing to get. So that brings us to uh, isolation. The first of our kind of like specialty damage options. And isolation is the hardest to utilize of, of the pairing of isolation and opportunism. And the reason is, is I saw a funny, a funny image in the, uh, the Ishtar discord this last week of, uh, a, this is a little minor spoiler, but the, the bosses of the final map were literally standing next to each other. So you could not isolate them without killing one or the other. And a smaller version of this happens all the time in the game. You have two bulkies. They walk in. They have the same movement range. So they just 
boop. They stand right next to each other, and until you kill one, you're not getting your isolation bonus. So it is hard to utilize, but more so than it being hard to utilize, sometimes it is nigh impossible to utilize. In my spreadsheet, I discount it by I discount its value by 70%. Because I think that only about 30% of the time are you really utilizing it in its totality. Now, that is counterbalanced by the fact that. 20% is, I think, the second largest damage up available in the game <laughs> after crit power. So that is a huge offering that you have with isolation. And it has more going for it than that in the sense that isolation pairs quite nicely with multi-hit where you can use the first hit to isolate an enemy and then use the subsequent hits to hit the isolated enemy. So if you have a, a bulky surrounded by a bunch of little minions, you pick off the little minions and then you hit the bulky for big isolated damage. So isolation is part of a healthy diet of damage and I think I put it in the low A tier because I think it is a strong contender that is bringing a unique damage source and a unique diminishing return to the table that is when it is utilized incredibly strong although sometimes hard to utilize. It's also nice that some enemies kind of naturally isolate themselves. Bats, Clars, runners. So they're easy to pick off with a little bit of isolation. And even in the early game, a 20% bump can make a big difference. Now, it's easier to utilize counterpart is opportunism. Uh, you're getting a little less, you're only getting 15%, but for builds that can enable opportunism, it's really easy to get your opportunism going. So you have a power staff, you probably just debuffed nine enemies with that uh, with that power staff hit and then you can come through with a one-handed axe and obliterate them on top of that the there are a lot of perks that make opportunism stronger or easier to get i'm thinking sadist i'm thinking contagion these types of things coupled with the aoe's power staff tome of secrets etc from my perspective makes opportunism one of those incredible engines where one a uh, member of our community has proven time and time again, like you can max your 5x opportunism on uh, on a hero using Sadist and some clever play with Contagion. I'm looking at you, Abigail. But broadly speaking, I think it is one that you can almost always get almost all the value out of. You still occasionally have to debuff things, but for the most part, you're getting a lot of value out of it. So I like it a lot, and I think I'm going to put it at the bottom of S tier. I think I like crit a little more. There's a little more synergy. The a lot of the synergy with uh, with opportunism is more building more opportunism, whereas I think crit is more of an enabler for some very strong and powerful builds. That moves us to momentum. Oh, momentum! Momentum is is kind of like my beloved. It's my it's my betrothed. It's my favorite. We recently did an all momentum weapons run on stream, and that was. That was quite fun. But momentum is, it's the source of all the biggest numbers because it stacks with everything else. It stacks with your isolation. It stacks with your opportunism. It stacks with your specific weapon damage. It stacks with your crit and your crit power. It stacks with, you know, I could go on and on. But like it, it is, it's there with everything else and is just doing good work. And the thing that is so unique about momentum, that is why I try and have at least one momentum here on every roster is that the the it works differently than everything else a hundred percent momentum I, I think hopefully you already know this but a hundred percent momentum means if you walk four tiles your hero's damage is multiplied by four basically at a hundred percent momentum that's insane there is no easier to max modifier in the game than the momentum multiplier because of the way your movement is multiplied by your momentum. That, that's a unique mechanism that makes it so that you can do a bunch of very large hits with a momentum hero. You are an exceptional boss killer. You are an exceptional elite killer. You are an exceptional uh, mirror shield handler because you're not doing a bunch of hits and 
you have the added benefit that you are rewarded for building a highly mobile hero that has a lot of skill range, has a lot of movement, has the ability to be in a bunch of different places at once. Momentum heroes are just exceptionally strong. And to that end, I put, I put them above crit. I, I think that momentum is just still, like, it took huge nerfs in the, in the er days before and after the 1.0 release. But despite that, it is just so good. It is exceptionally good in my mind. So momentum gets that coveted S rank because I, I think it's, it's very, very special. Now we go to poison. Poison is so weird. People in the last two videos have left comments being like, why didn't you talk about Poison? And the reason is it doesn't play with anybody. There's, there's nothing interesting to say about Poison. If you have 350% Poison damage, your Poison just hits for 350% more and nothing else changes. Uh, like, give me a perk where your damage can somehow be incorporated into your Poison damage, and I'm all ears. But right now, Poison is a one-trick pony. Like, and it's not a bad pony. I think that's the thing that is so interesting about it is that poison has kind of been balanced in the game to be good standalone. It's, it's basically the only hero build that I can think of that just kind of works on its own. And I think it's why poison multi-hit works so well is that the poison part of it requires basically nothing. You don't really have to take any of the poison column perks except maybe potent toxins and maybe epidemic depending on what you're doing and if you get potent toxins you're going to get a hundred percent off of that if you take the level ups appropriately 30 percent is a large increase and where you're going to end up is you're going to end up with a hero that kills the cannon fodder horde enemies with one tick of poison from any of their abilities you fire out a bees it kills everybody that it touches except for the big bads and for the big bads you have the ability to apply selective poison you can use dagger and apply like two three thousand poison with one set of multi hits or those types of things so it's it's an interesting standalone that meshes well with some other builds like, like multi-hit as an example, and it's relatively strong all on its own. And so I think for that reason, I put poison like up here in the A tier. Maybe we'll put it bottom of A, and that's probably going to be controversial, but like I think my first Lakeburg solo hero run was a was was a hero with a bee staff. And it's just because you get volatile, you get some propagation bounces, and you just kill the entire horde. It's not great for farming corpses by any stretch of the imagination, but just the fact that only taking secondary stats and, and rolling my face off looking for poison is enough to do that is a bit mind-boggling. Next is another weird one to evaluate. Uh, total damage. Uh, total damage is a keyword that is used for basically four perks that increase your, uh, your hero's damage out of band from everything else. It's, uh, it's its own column with its own diminishing returns, and it doesn't, uh, it just is its own adder. In the spreadsheet, there is a column that says, you know, perks basically. And the four of them that we should talk about are Proximity Shot, Flexibility, Don't Panic, and Big Game Hunter. Uh, proximity Shot is unbelievable. If you are running a momentum pistol user, 40% increased damage for standing next to someone when you have a ton of mobility is no big deal. The way that it works is it always modifies based on the nearest point of the AoE. So Grape Shot Blast is also getting a 40% increase in damage, which is a, a big increase. Flexibility, again, fantastic because most of the best builds, in my opinion, are hybrid builds. Your Power Staff, Sledgehammers, so on and so forth. Your Wand, Hand Crossbows. So enabling flexibility is just a 25% increase that doesn't have a lot, of, a lot to think about. 
Don't panic, 40% plus accuracy, and we're potentially farming corpses, so we're bringing people in and then we're hitting them 40% harder. I mean, it's it's a no-brainer once again. Like, these are all fantastic. And then Big Game Hunter, you're having a problem with Bulkies, you're having a problem with Twisteds, you're having a problem with Nessie, you're having a problem with the final bosses on Glintfine. Big Game Hunter is going to be up to a 50% increase if the enemy has more than 2,400 HP. Again, really, really good. Short version is, so many of the best perks in the game are the best because total damage is its own pocket of goodness that is a adder that you can't get any other way. And for that reason, it's got to take the last, last S slot. And I say last, last, because the last thing we need to talk about is not a stat, at least not directly, but it's... It's something that I came to recognize as part of building the damage spreadsheet. And that is that base damage is your is the the canvas upon which you paint the things that you uh, that you create. It is the baseline upon which everything else scales. And that is why the spear, is going to be doing more damage than the scepter for all of eternity. It's because the spear has a higher base damage. And it makes it really hard to think about because this base damage is inextricably coupled to the skills that you have access to. Which is weird, right? The idea that, sure, the spear has high base damage, but it's also only has impale, rush, skewer, and triple, uh, triple swipe. So it's, it's hard to evaluate, like, unless you're evaluating apples to apples. So I put this in here to talk about that apples to apples comparison. And the way that I generally think about it is a level up of your weapon with nothing, nothing else changing is about an 11% damage increase on average. And going from level 0 weapon to a level 5 weapon is about a 72% increase. These are all approximate, they're all averages based on some spreadsheeting, etc. But I think it's a useful thing to keep in mind because you might not want to give up a 8% damage, 5% crit level 0 weapon for a level 1 weapon. And knowing how to make those trade-offs is kind of an important thing. But it's so hard for me to put it anywhere on this on this. So if we're doing the tier list and I'm thinking about it, is base damage all that important? I think the answer is kind of no. Like I, I pick a weapon based on the utility of its toolkit first and its base damage second. So I don't think I can put it in A tier because I'm not going to replace a power staff with a magic orb if a magic orb had more base damage. I don't think that's the way it works. So I think I'm going to put it down here in C tier because it's one of those things where when it's important, you'll upgrade it. And I'm, I'm going to move it up immediately. But like when you're going to upgrade your weapon, you're going to upgrade your weapon. And that should be a priority and that should be important because it's a potentially like an 11% increase that you're not going to get anywhere anywhere else. It's going to be, you know, the tide that rises all, raises all ships. But the flip side is, is chasing base damage for base damage's sake is not necessarily uh, worth anything. So there you have it. That's my tier list. I need to remember to take a screenshot of it, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel pretty good about it. I think we utilized most of the levels. I think C tier is about where I expected it to be and, and reliability tier is about where I expected it to be. I think health and healing are unsurprisingly the situationals with you know an honorable mention maybe to multi-hit and stun that I just didn't want to put in there. But I feel, I feel pretty good. Uh, you know, like if I were going to tweak anything, maybe maybe that goes up there just because I think damage is more important than armor, but armor is pretty good when, when you need it. A little armor goes a long way. But yeah, I think we're going to call it there. This was, this was a fun series of videos to make. Uh, if you haven't seen the previous two videos, I would encourage you to check out the link in the video description or maybe I'll put a card... I think they go over here. I don't know where they go. But uh, but yeah, check out those videos as well. We learned a lot. We did a lot of science. We created some cool spreadsheets and those types of things. But these tier list videos are always fun to do because they force us to make 
difficult decisions. They uh, they force us to choose when the information is incomplete and choosing is a bit of a mistake. If, uh, if you like these kind of videos, a like and a subscribe is greatly appreciated. Uh, we recently changed the way that the channel works so you'll only get notified on my YouTube when this happens. If you wanna see me play the, la the last spell live on Twitch or YouTube, you can find me every Wednesday doing that. And, and other than that, I'm just really excited about the website launch. Uh, you know, no pressure to go buy anything, but I think there's a lot of useful information there and I'm gonna keep on building up the corpus of things that the community has put together. And as for the merch, I think it's just fun. You know, I want to keep making things like uh, like the reliability mug because it's I think it's funny. You know, I think it's it's a fun thing to be able to do. And we're going to try and keep the quality really high. There aren't a lot of things in the store right now. And the things that are there are really nice. Like uh, the the, t the the sweatshirt that I showed you earlier, this one here is really, really soft. And I'm not going to put things up there that I haven't gotten my hands on and confirmed the quality of. Uh, I'm still waiting on the t-shirt that's up there to get shipped, but I will take it down if it's anything less than perfectly matching my standards. But for now, that's it for me. Thank you for watching. As always, it's uh, super fun to make these videos, and I love hearing all of the feedback that you have. I can't wait to get flamed in the comments for uh, for all of the terrible decisions I made, and I guarantee you that there are at least three people out there that are going to leave me qu comments about reliability just to torture me. So until next time, thank you for watching, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.